This is live from Lodi Garden, a conversation about the world, sitting in a 15th century garden in New Delhi, the capital of India. Your host is the award-winning historian, Hindul Sengupta. This is live from Lodi Garden, I'm Hindul Sengupta. We are back in the wonderful Lodi Garden. You can hear, hear the birds chirping all around us uh, and the tombs of the Lodi kings sprinkled around this 15th century garden. I am delighted to return here once again. Delighted to return with Professor Salvatore Babones. Congratulations to, to, to all the congratulations for all the what should I say hectic schedule that you have had in <laughs> thank India. Thank you, thank you. It's been very gratifying. Yeah, and uh, you know a lot of um, interest in your work and what you have had to say. I want to begin by asking you, why do you think in this moment in India's history there's been such interest in what you have had to say? Well, obviously, there's a, a new India. I'm not the first person to observe that. You know, we've talked a lot about the con market gang, and the first, the it's first amazing thing that you know this. Oh, well, I, I've heard it endlessly on podcasts, on interviews, from on emails from yeah. friends, on Twitter, and so of course, the first thing I did when I got to Delhi was go, go to the con market. To the con right? Market, I needed yeah. to buy books. Uh, but then uh, the next day, I had an interview in Noida, okay. and I saw two massive shopping centers right across the street from each other uh, and it immediately struck me that the monthly sales of the entire con market would be swallowed up in one afternoon in one of these shopping centers now obviously i don't think we should you, know, you should tear down the con market it's uh, an institution and it'll survive and hopefully it will thrive and be redeveloped and look very nice but uh, when i think about what is where is India? Yeah. Uh, for good or for bad, there's something lost, I know. It, there's a romantic attachment to the past, but India today is not in the Khan market. India today is in those two giant shopping centers in Noida. And that's a new India. Those are people who are ready for a new dialogue on the country, uh, want to move past the, oh, move past the pompadour past, as we call it, uh, the, 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 the small group of people who have strong ties to the West and instead uh, have its own voice uh, on the national stage. And I think soon enough it'll be their own voice on the global stage. When I was uh, going to college uh, to begin with in Delhi, uh, Khan market used to be a fairly sleepy, diplomatic, largely diplomatic, largely bureaucratic market full of... Mm -hmm. But today, you know, you must have noticed in Khan Market, it has all the new brands, you know, it has, it has the, you know, the big sporting brands from America, <laughs> it, has the, it has Apple, you know, stores and so sure, on and so forth. So, sure. even that old market, in a sense, uh, has the, all these new elements, right? right. So, uh, you know, I, I sometimes wonder whether even the old gets renewed and refurbished and Regentrified in a sense. Oh, of and course, that's part if, of India too. If if I come back in in, in probably in in by 2030, uh, I would guarantee that the con market has been redeveloped. <laughs> All of everything looks much more gleaming and modern at the con market. A few stores, famous stores like Bari Sons, where I bought all my books, uh, they'll still be there in the old-fashioned way with looking like a Harry Potter store in the middle of the glitzy new <laughs> cotton market. But you know, that's inevitable. Uh, but still, you know, redevelopment of old spaces uh, will occur alongside the generation of new spaces. And my point is that those new spaces, the old spaces are not disappearing. You know, and the old, yeah. for that matter, uh, in Indian politics, the old Congress party is not disappearing. The old political dynasty families are not disappearing. It's that a new India is overtowering them at this point because the new India is simply so much larger than that old India. Fascinating. Uh, I wonder, um, you know, most of the conversation and dialogue about India, you know, India, you've come at a moment when India is about to take over the presidency of G20. Sure. Right. And um, this G20 presidency will be important to India because India has just become the fifth largest economy in the right. world. Yeah. I recently saw some calculations which say as early as 2027, it might become the third largest economy in the world. Sure. That is, 
you know, I don't know how... Whether it's 27, 28, 28 29, 29 it, it's a symbolic you know, moment, it doesn't really that's matter. That's right. So, and then therefore this, this uh, G20 presidency is a sort of, you know, bridge to uh, the third largest economy kind of presidency for India. And India is going all out to do this, right? And I wonder whether uh, many of the themes that you've touched upon in your conversations in India, um, I wonder how you connect in your head to this moment of India's rise, right? Because it's not no rise, perhaps, of any nation is easy, but certainly India's rise with its background, with its diversity, with its colonial past, is not going to be easy or hasn't been easy. So I wonder whether you look at this from the moment of India's rise and how that is being perceived around the world. I think India's rise will, believe it or not, be relatively easy, straightforward, no problems for India in the world. The world is fundamentally well disposed towards India. Partly that's a heritage of the non-aligned movement. India is one of the few countries that can uh, comfortably, one of the few large countries, rich rich in overall GDP terms, you know, big weighty countries that can uh, talk to the developing world with no sense of uh, you know, neo-colonialism or being overbearing. There, there won't be any articles about India like there have been about China and China becoming the new colonists in Africa. You, you know, as India develops in Africa and the Middle East, I'm confident that that will be on a peer-to-peer -peer basis and will be well received. In the same way India's rise is well received in the West, at least by government and business, and it's even well received in, uh, in Russia, <laughs> in the European East. Uh, you know, the only real problem is China. Uh, even the Muslim world is not opposed to India. There's a unique issue with India and Pakistan. And if I had to guess, I would guess that India-Pakistan relations will improve long before India-China relations improve. That is to say, I'm, I'm hopeful that these old enmities will be put behind them. No, I think the real challenge and, and the, the real pain in India's rise won't come from international relations. It will come inside India. It will come from India's own internal political debates. That's where the, the difficulties lie for a new India. It's not in its international relations. Those are, those are going to be a easy by comparison. The challenges will be the internal fault lines that you have to face in India itself. Many of the internal fault lines are being replicated in other parts of the world. For instance, uh, the Khalistan movement, which mm -hmm. is the breakaway right. of a part of yes. Punjab, you know, this long history of terrorism and so on and so forth. That has been, in a sense, the Indian Punjab doesn't have that, you know, anymore. But that entire movement has become, you know, its natural home right. today has become Canada, right. right? And you would know that there is a Khalistan referendum right. that's happening in Canada. Um, you know, the Indian government has often protested with the Canadian government sure. about, you know, its sort of ties of its politicians in the you know, wider Canadian political space to this movement, uh, including the presence of many extremely problematic characters, including sure. people who support terrorism sure. and so on and so forth on Canadian soil. That's one part of it. Sure. Similar things are happening in the United Kingdom. You know, when I was at Oxford, the Indian uh, embassy, in a sense, was attacked twice, right, right, by these mobs of people and so on and so forth. Um, so, in a sense, the fault lines that you correctly point out are also getting globalized. You know, the Kashmir right. uh, issue has now become globalized, right. in a sense. We saw what happened in Leicester, for instance. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, in academia, the world that you come from, we are seeing the, you know, the rise of this entire sort of dismantled Hindutva right. only and it would be, you know, uh, that was one. Part, that would be one part of it if it was confined to that. But then, very quickly, it becomes right. dismantle Hinduism. So I wonder how you join all these dots on the sort of globalization of all these fault lines. Uh, the uh, the academic intellectual movements are entirely distinct from the diaspora movements. Let's be clear. The diaspora movements are the burden of having a successful diaspora. Now, India always wants to take advantage of its diaspora. It benefits mightily from its diaspora. Well, it also has the burden of its diaspora. And Indians maybe have to ask, uh, you know, can we take the, uh, can we take the, the, the problem, the, can we take the bad with the good? Uh, Indian, the Indian diaspora, whether that's Sikh or Muslim, or uh, in some cases a Dalit diaspora who are attempting to use 
uh, their platforms in democratic countries like the United Kingdom and like the United States, like Canada, like Australia, who are attempting to use these platforms to influence politics back in India and India's international relations, they are just the latest in a long line of countries where diasporas in democratic countries have driven policy. You know, American policy towards the Soviet Union was driven by white <laughs> By, by the whites, you know, who were kicked out of Russia, the capitalist Russian diaspora, uh, who for a long time formed U.S.-Russia policy. Uh, this is nothing new. Uh, uh, Louis Kossuth spoke at the uh, U.S. Congress in the 19th century. There's a bust of him in the American Congress. Uh, the British have had the problem for decades of American support for IRA terrorism in Ireland, uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, and even though the U.S. and U.K. are the closest of allies, the U.S. has consistently uh, provided a haven for Irish, Northern Irish Catholic terrorists. Right? So India is not alone in this, is what I'm saying. There's no easy solution to it. You can't get a foreign country to repress its own citizens on your behalf. All you can ask is reasonably ask for is the maintenance of law and order. And you can also be confident that the host societies have no idea what's going on in these debates. Uh, what you know, They know that there's violence in Leicester. Who's responsible? What's happening? Who's who? What are the fault lines are completely unknown? Canadians know there's this Khalistan thing <laughs> that involves people with turbans. They may know that it's Sikh related. They probably don't know much beyond that. Now, you will get some fresh-faced students on college campuses who hear a speech about the oppression of Sikhs, the oppression of Muslims, the oppression of Dalits, and you know, think they have to join this cause, the same as we've seen for the Palestinian cause on campuses. Um, but I don't think you need to worry too much about that. This is a problem India can certainly accommodate one way or another. Now, the intellectual battle on India, I think, is more serious because intellectuals shape the narrative about countries. We live, even in 2022, with the internet and all the proliferation of news media, we live in an information poor environment when it comes to understanding India, or frankly any country outside the United States and maybe the United Kingdom. People just don't know who's who. If anything, the proliferation of mass media has and, and social media has resulted not in a uh, not in a, a greater uh, variety of voices. It's resulted in a concentration of voices among a small number who are at the center of social networks. Um, it's, a, it's a characteristic of networks that they tend to concentrate power in one place. Even though the networks are a very dispersed way of communicating, they end up being very concentrated. Uh, the result is that a very small number of fervently anti-India, or in some cases not anti-India, but anti-Modi intellectuals, completely dominate the international narrative on India. And I think very unfortunately, anti-Modi intellectuals have allied with anti-India intellectuals rather than allying with pro-Modi forces in India to seek a conversation and reform. There is also something called the caste legislation, since we're talking about, yeah. you know, uh, the globalization of fault sure. lines. Uh, in America, there's a giant push to enforce caste legislation, sure. right? Uh, including in uh, this activism is now spread to major American tech companies, right. in places like Google and so on and so forth, right? Um, many in India are worried that this caste legislation is being pushed to, in a sense, strengthen a fault line, which actually liberalization, and many scholars have written about this, um, you know, westernization, liberalization, modernization, uh, per capita rise of income have in many ways have started to blur in India. Right. But it's sort of, you know, a legislation of this kind, especially in a country mm -hmm. like America, would percolate in other parts of the Western world and would accentuate the fault line. It would right. give, you know, uh, particular forces reason to sort of keep stoking those fires. I wonder how you see that. We have a global debate as to whether the best way to promote social inclusion is to identify people, put a marker on them, and then specifically promote them through affirmative action, or if the best way to fight social exclusion 
is to be completely blind as to people's backgrounds and treat everybody as an individual. Personally, I lean more towards the second while recognizing the need for some degree of the first in special cases. But this debate is, is not simply about Dalit uh, advancement. It's about, it, it is a general debate among liberal societies about how best to fight problems in society. Now, I don't know which is the best solution. There is no definitive social science answer. Whether the account is true or not, people believing that they have been socially excluded and denied promotion due to their caste. Now, obviously none of us want that. The companies don't want that. Uh, caste Hindus, uh, to the extent that you still believe in caste, don't, don't want that as a whole. Uh, but if it happens, it happens. No, I, I can't verify that it's happened. Okay. The problem is when this becomes politicized. So we have a phenomenon where Western intellectuals, uh, you know, uh, Western intellectuals at places like Harvard and Yale, the Ivy League, um, at NGOs, have been trying to use this to their own advantage. That is, if Dalits want to speak for themselves and pursue cases of discrimination because they believe they've been harmed, I'm all for that. I mean, people should stand up for themselves. They may be wrong, they may be right, let's find out. But when uh, people, when outsiders step in to want to speak for Dalits, I think that's fundamentally no better than a Brahmin wanting to speak for Dalits. I don't know, prima facie, that these attempts at legislation in California, I don't know that these are necessarily wrong. If the problem is there, these may be necessary. I, I don't know if company uh, attempts internally within the company to promote Dalit advancement, I don't know whether those are right or wrong. I want to stress that is a, an empirical question. That's not a theoretical question that we can just say, you know, we've reasoned somehow that this is wrong and it's evil and must be stopped. We need to know, maybe some survey work. Now, it would be nice if Silicon Valley companies, instead of responding to activism and activist pressures from outside, were to actually conduct systematic surveys of their own, uh, of their own workers to try to get a, a real empirical grasp of, is there a problem? If there is a problem, was it just one comment in, the, you know, in a WhatsApp group somewhere, or is it a systematic problem? Um, we'd like to know this. I don't think at this point we have the data to really understand the problem. Do you think, you know, there is already, the Western world already has a problem with China. There are legitimate concerns from some quarters, which have been voiced from some quarters uh, in the West, about one more billion strong, you know, 1.4 billion <laughs> strong country. I haven't, he, I haven't heard these concerns, but um, if, if you say there are, I'll take your word for it. But do you, do you think that that is one of the concerns that India faces? I mean, of course, the, as you correctly point out, that India's rise has been far, far more peaceful than China. Yeah. And India has consistently worked towards ensuring that it's a peaceful, stable rise. It's not a disruptive, it's not a revisionist rise. Right. It's a peaceful, stable, cooperative ride. So I wonder whether, you know, clearly you haven't heard it, so therefore, you know, it's probably uh, not that serious. But do you think this entire reinvention of non-alignment is a sort of way in which India can ensure its peaceful rise? That, you know, this, this, this narrative of, uh, of, of, being, uh, of not being a revisionist power, of not wanting to you know, fundamentally disrupt the world order, and so on and so forth. Uh, in America and Australia, in the security state, I've heard nothing but uh, a strong desire that India's rise should be faster. <laughs> that they want to see a strong India sure. for two reasons. They want it to counter China, uh, so they don't have to. <laughs> the more China has to deal with India, the less China can deal with the United States. Uh, and they, let's be honest, they want to sell weapons to India. Um, and there's a strong desire to sell American military hardware uh, to India. Uh, I don't think that's the best reason for wanting, you know, I, 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 if I wanted well-wishers, I wouldn't necessarily want well-wishers for those reasons, but, but nonetheless, those, those reasons are there, right? We take now, well wishes where we can find now, them. Now, if, if the United States is so upset about India's relationship with Russia, uh, it I, I think most of that is driven by the American desire to sell defense equipment to India, not by the Ukraine crisis, not, uh, you know, th these are, uh, the Ukraine crisis can be used as a 
you know, as a tool in that debate. But fundamentally, it's about why don't you buy an American early warning radar system instead of a Russian early warning radar system? This, this, this is what, or anti-missile system, it's, you know, frig, you know frigates, you know, this, this is really what it's all about. Now, um, if India does continue to be uh, independent in its foreign policy, uh, the U.S. will live with that. All America needs is an independent India, because none of India's neighbors uh, are place. Uh, none of India's America has few has no real friends among India's neighbors. Now I, I know that yes, there's a Pakistan is a major non-NATO ally. We all know that's for political reasons. There's, there's no reality to that situation. The U.S. is, is no longer close to Pakistan. Um, uh, look, there. There, there's very little pushback in the world, except from China. There's very little pushback to India's rise on the global stage. Now, one thing I do remind Indians, there's a big push in India for India to be a member of the permanent member of the Security Council, the P5, to become the P6 and include India. Um, I actually, and I know that you know, your viewers won't be happy with this, I actually wouldn't support that. Uh, the, the P5 are composed of interventionist countries who meddle in world affairs. And fundamentally, the reason why there's a P5 is that we don't want a nuclear war to happen because two of these permanent members, you know, come to blows with each other in some distant land. You know, the U.S. and Russian both have troops in Syria. They start fighting and, or, or in Ukraine or in... You know, so the, the reason for the P5 is to veto situations where the major interests of these interventionist powers collide. India to date, up till 2022, has never been an interventionist power. I don't wish on you the burden of becoming an interventionist power in the future. And unless you become an interventionist power, there's no reason to be on the P5 other than politics and national pride. I put this to you, while you make a strong case and it is indeed true that India has never sought to be an inter interventionist power, nor does it seek to be an inter interventionist power today. Barring, of course, you know, few examples like, say, Sri Lanka and so on and so forth. Um, but in a world where India is the fifth largest economy, sure. maybe the third, what validity does the UN Security Council have or does its validity go down if it doesn't have the fifth or the third largest economy as part of it? Look, this is to misunderstand the Security Council. The Security Council was formed as the group of allies at the end of World War II with the idea that they would guarantee the peace. Within five years, that vision, that vision was completely, within three years, you know, that vision was completely outdated. Uh, for the last 75 years, what the Security Council has been is a prevent nuclear war club. That's why they're there. They're there to ensure, that you, you know, look, it, it's pure coincidence, it's not foresight, but if you look around the world, who's sending troops out in the world to do things? The Americans, the Russians, the British, the French in Africa especially, and now, let's face it, China is starting to enter this game as well. It is ambitious for all the talk in China about uh, you know China respects sovereignty, uh, you know it doesn't, and China is starting to become an interventionist power as well. Now, if India becomes an interventionist state wanting to support one side or the other in Ethiopia's civil war, if India decides to send troops to Yemen because it wants to intervene on the Iranian side against Saudi Arabia, all right, then you need to be in the Security Council P5. Uh, but I hope India doesn't take that course, and if India doesn't there is no reason for the other members of the Security Council to allow India in. And I would argue, I know this is very controversial here, I would argue it would be a bad idea for them to allow India in, which would then Latin Americans would say, why isn't Brazil in? And that, you know, to, it's a bad idea to expand the permanent veto-wielding members of the Security Council. I mean, give India a permanent seat, I don't mind. But giving it a veto, the problem is the more countries that have a veto, the less relevant the Security Council will become. And right now, for good or for bad, as imperfect as it is, the Security Council is the only institution keeping us away from nuclear war. As we come to the end of this interview, I have two last questions for you, two or three maybe. Uh, we're talking about the UN. So many people in India wonder, 
what relevance does the UN still have, you know, in a world where constantly diplomats from every yeah. other country seems to essentially go onto the stage in the UN and say this body is dysfunctional, sure. right? <laughs> Um, I, I wonder what you think about that. Sure. And indeed, for rising nations like India, you know, their participation in the UN, in, in amidst this clamor that the UN is, is so ineffective, so um, non-essential, how do you think a country like India should look at the UN system and negotiate it? Uh, the United Nations today is a standard-setting body. It's not a political body. I mean, I know everyone, it is a plum posting for diplomats from countries, from very poor countries. I don't mean India, I mean for people from uh, you know, sub-Saharan Africa, from some of uh, the poor countries of Central America and Southeast Asia. It's a plum assignment. Oh, you get to go to New York, all expenses paid, and you don't even have to pay your parking tickets. You know, you're, you're a pasha in New York, and, and they may love it. Uh, and they love to grandstand at the United Nations and all of these resolutions. And uh, okay, that, that's all fine, but that's not what the UN does. What the UN does is collect data, set standards, provide technical assistance. If you are a, a conflict-ridden country and you need to set up, re-establish your uh, technical infrastructure to collect data on your economy, to, to manage agriculture, to ensure your people get fed, the United Nations is there. And that's a very important role. Uh, United Nations High Commission for Refugees, of course, feeds millions of people around the world, ensures that they have some basic modicum of, of human dignity. Uh, the UN does very good work, but that very good work is not the political work of the General Assembly. The, the General Assembly is uh, it, it, the General Assembly is largely a, a meaningless institution, and it will remain that way. And if anything, it's a good safety valve. You know, we, we, it's fine to have a, a, it's fine to have a useless venue that where people can no one takes complain. seriously, where someone can go complain. Where if you want to pass your 85th anti-Israel resolution, you can pass your 85th anti-Israel resolution. Please just don't invade Israel. You know, and don't kill people, and don't have terrorist attacks. Pass all the resolutions you want. It's a safety valve, and that's valuable. Isn't is non-alignment being reinvented and is uh, India being able to instrumentalize the idea of non-alignment to ensure that it's the perceptions and the narratives of its rise remain consistently peaceful? Non-alignment failed as a movement because logically there is no alignment among non-aligned <laughs> countries. And so each non-aligned country went its own way. Non-alignment is the dominant form of interaction in the, in the geopolitical world. I mean, most of Latin America, most of Southeast Asia, uh, India, of course, is you know, solidly non-aligned. So much of the developing world is non-aligned and much of the rich world. I mean, you may say that all of these countries in Europe are part of NATO. What does it mean to be part of NATO if you don't have a military? Yeah, what does Portugal do for NATO? <laughs> what does Iceland do for NATO? So most of NATO is not aligned. I mean, it's a problem for NATO that when NATO confronts Russia, really that means you know, Poland, Estonia, <laughs> United Kingdom, and United States confront Russia. It, it doesn't mean NATO. Austria is not doing anything uh, for NATO. Germany doesn't even have a military. Now, Europeans tell me they're thrilled that Germany doesn't have a military, but Germany, which should be the bulwark of NATO, has essentially demilitarized. So non-alignment has become the uh, default approach of countries that are out of the news. Now, the US, Russia, China, you know, they're very aligned, very engaged, but uh, most of the world is more like India. My last question, um, you know, we began by talking about India as a rising power, and uh, if, if all predictions, you know, uh, turn out to be right, in, within this decade, India will become the third largest economy sure. in the world. What will change for India and what will change for the world when India hits that position? Because it's going to be a world of India, the United States and China, yeah. essentially, out of which, at least with one country, India has fairly antagonistic relationships. Right. Um, I would say, go even further and say by 2050, India will certainly be the second largest economy in the world, uh, certainly overtake China by mid-century. Uh, I don't, I, I, sorry, we, <laughs> we have some distractions here in the garden. 
Um, I think not talking too much about non-alignment. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the dogs are out. Uh, the dogs of war are, are here to uh, right, to yeah. pursue us. Yeah. Look, uh, I, I really don't view India's rise as a problem for the world or something that will cause trouble for India. It will cause trouble for China. But there is no chance, yeah. no chance that India is going to launch an invasion along the line of actual control. Of course. Okay. If India were a bellicose country, then I would be concerned about India's rise, and others would too. But given that India's stance has been and will continue to be purely defensive, I don't think there are any practical strategic implications of India's rise. I mean, it means a lot for India. I think it's broadly good for the region because India can be and has been, I mean, India has been for a long time a uh, provider of stability and in the region. Goods. Yes, whether it comes to Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and all three countries, Bhutan, and all four countries, India has been an, a very important stabilizing factor, keeping everything in the region calm and secure. I'm disappointed that doesn't quite extend to Myanmar. Uh, I know India has very deep ties with Myanmar, you know, and uh, a long-standing relationship. Uh, my hope would be with India's rise that ultimately India would also be able to stabilize Myanmar and Pakistan, which are the two very unstable countries in the region. And people may think it's crazy of me to talk about India stabilizing Pakistan, but the world changes. The world changes. Uh, people still have you know, relative relations. People still speak the same language across the line of control or across the, 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 the demarcate or, or across the formal border with Pakistan. You know, naturally, the natural port of Punjab is Karachi. That's right. Now, Yes, of course, Punjab can survive, Indian Punjab can survive without Karachi. But I wonder if one reason for the stagnation of Punjab for the last 30, 40 years um, isn't maybe due to the fact that the natural economic flow has been prevented in Punjab by international relations. It certainly has harmed Pakistan's growth, that Pakistan doesn't have access to the Indian market, that Pakistan doesn't have access to Indian investment, that Indian know-how is not being leveraged yes. to build a modern Pakistan economy. Well, you know, I maybe I'm too much of an optimist, but I am very hopeful that we will see India, as it becomes a bigger economy, as it becomes a more confident country, that it'll be a force for stability even in Pakistan and Myanmar. And once that's accomplished, and I don't say an interventionist power, not intervening to overturn governments, just to force for stability through economic networks and shared prosperity, well then, what problems does India have? That's the neighborhood. And the only possible enemy India has is, you know, over the high mountains in China, <laughs> in China where, uh, you know, hopefully China won't attack India again, but I don't think India's rise is problematic. If anything, the more India rises, the less chance there is of a Chinese attack. On that wonderful, wonderful positive note, thank you very much, Professor, for spending time with us in Lothi Garden. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, we had a bit of a cacophony from the garden also. But thank you for coming by and having this wonderful conversation. We wish you all the very uh, best for the rest of your trip in India and a safe flight back home. Thank, thank you, you very much. My pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. You are listening to Live from Lodi Garden with Hindul Sangupta. This is a Global Order presentation, edited and produced by Koteshwar Rao and directed by Rishi Suri.